Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the week, Lord. Some of us had tough weeks, and we just praise you in the middle of those problems. We thank you, God, that you're a God that sees everything and nothing surprises you. And our life is in your hands. Thank you for the breath in our lungs, the blood in our bodies, God. Thank you. You are good. Thank you, God. We worship you. And now, God, I just pray for every soul that's in person and every soul that's online. Would you move in every heart, God? I pray that every heart, again, hears a specific word from heaven, Lord. A word from your Holy Spirit. Undeniable word, Lord. I pray people walk out of this place thinking, how in the world, how in the world did he know that? And may they know it's not me, but it's you, Lord. And likewise, those people who are watching online, I pray they hear a word from you, God, and it makes them stop in their tracks, whether they're listening to this sermon while they're driving in the car or they're at home, maybe they're in bed or in the kitchen, or or maybe they're working out right now, Lord, and they're just, you know, working in the middle of reps. Whatever it is, God, would you speak to them, Lord, and remind them of your great love, Lord. I pray your grace goes deep today and, and online and every soul. It's in the name of Jesus Christ to pray all this. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, trust God. Do that. Just tell them, trust God. Do that online also. Just type in, trust God. That's what we're talking about today. Trust God. Thank you so much for being at church today, guys. It's so great to have you today. I'm excited. Uh, <coughs> um, hey, I'm excited about cinnamon rolls. I'm just telling you. I don't know if you're excited about cinnamon rolls. Every uh, uh, Christmas Eve, you know, we have an after party at my house from all the, all the people that are part of the Christmas Eve stage and, and worship. There's We do. We do. Anyway, but on, on Christmas morning, uh, Grace makes cinnamon rolls. And she, she's serious. Like, she's not playing when she makes cinnamon rolls. Like, she starts them the night before. Anybody do all-night cinnamon rolls? Have you ever done that? They're so good. Um, you should come over to our house on Christmas Day, and uh, you can have some. But uh, they start at night, and uh, I don't know what she does, but I understand there's all kinds of ingredients that are put together. And, and then she has to put them in the refrigerator overnight and has to sit in the refrigerator for a certain amount of time. It has to be just the right amount of time for it to rise. And then she takes them out in the morning and then she, she, she sits it on the table and it has to sit on the table for just the right amount of time. And then after that, she puts it in the oven and I think it's for like 35 minutes or something, some specific amount of time. And she puts it in the oven and it's in the oven now for just the right amount of of time. And you have to be really careful because if you don't do it for just the right amount of time, you could have some problems. I mean, timing, timing is everything with like baking and cinnamon rolls and all this kinds of stuff. But if it's undercooked, it could be undercooked in the center. It can be gooey and squishy and doughy. But if it's overcooked, it could be burnt. It could be hard. It could taste dry. Timing is everything. And you have a God who is intentional. He's purposeful about timing. That's your God. Let me just, let me just give you something to think about. God orchestrated your life, even today, at this very moment, for you to be at church to hear this message. At this very moment, you're watching online and you might be thinking, well, I just stumbled across this. God brought you to this message at this exact time. Some of you, it might be habit, but others of you, maybe you weren't planning on coming tonight. Maybe you plan on, you know, you were planning on coming another, another day or something happened where you thought, you know what, maybe I should, maybe I should go to church. At just this time, God brought you here because he wants you to hear this message. And he has been orchestrating, doing some things in your life to bring you to this point where you can turn to him with all of your heart. God wants all of you. He wants you to surrender yourself to him. He wants you to receive his son, Jesus Christ, the ultimate Christmas present. He wants you to receive him as your Lord and Savior. He wants you to learn to walk by faith and not by sight and not in a spirit of fear, but in a spirit of power and a love and a sound mind. God has brought you here at this very moment to hear this message. Do you believe that? I, the longer I walk with God, the more I realize there's fewer and fewer coincidences. 
The longer I walk with God, I discover how intentional he is, how purposeful he is. And I don't stress as much as I used to. I don't worry as much as I used to because I recognize the God who controls all of the cosmos is also, by his grace, concerned about our little orbit as well. He's concerned about our orbit on how we live and where we go to school and work and play and home and all this stuff. And I've just discovered there's this incredible freedom in trusting God. Today, the title of the sermon is God's timing is perfect. Say that with me. God's timing is perfect. And it's so perfect. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace and your love. And thank you, God, that um, thank you for your love. Thank you. Would you move through this message in a special way, Lord? Get, help us, Lord, as much as we can on this side of heaven. Give us a new perspective of your timing and help us to trust you, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I got to talk about this, guys, before we jump into this here. Hopefully, uh, you got a, a, a Christmas Eve invite card. You got it? You might want to pull it out, or you're getting one, going to get one while you, when you leave. But uh, <clears throat> those of you who are online as well, we have six Christmas Eve services this coming week. How many Christmas Eve services? Six. So for those of you who are busy, it's really more difficult for you to give an excuse now. We have three days for you to choose. We have a service on Thursday night at 7 p.m., a service on Friday night at 5 p.m. and 7, and on Saturday, 2, 4, and 6 o'clock, all the services are identical, and there's a lot of work going into these services, guys. They're all built around this theme where the angel Gabriel told Mary, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. So please come. And if you're planning on being out of town because you're going to go somewhere else, do me a favor and invite someone to come to church. You can do that. I have, I've invited probably about, um, probably close to six people just in this last week. I've invited people and saying, hey, will you come? And I, I invited this one person. And they said, can I bring my girlfriend? I said, yeah, I bring your girlfriend. I don't care. Bring you wherever you want. And, uh, and, 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 and just have it in your pocket. I always have an extra one in my pocket. And I want to just challenge you to give this to someone that you think needs to know the love of God. Someone that needs a new beginning. Someone that needs a new start. Somebody that just needs to know God's grace and mercy for their life. You know, the ultimate act of love is your love for someone's soul. That's the ultimate gesture. Your love for you, introducing them to Jesus Christ. There's nothing greater than that. So I want to encourage you, uh, pass one out and attend Christmas Eve services. Come, it'll be a lot of fun, guys. I'm super excited about these services we're planning. It's going to be a a lot of fun. So uh, when you look in the Bible... You see examples of uh, timing. You see examples of how God moves. In fact, in Scripture, it's been said there's over 300 prophecies about Jesus. Over 300 prophecies. And there's been mathematicians that have looked at the prophecies and thought about the likelihood of every prophecy coming to fulfillment. And it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. And Jesus has been fulfilling every prophecy. One we're waiting on is the return of Christ and what's going to happen in the future. But he's been fulfilling every prophecy. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, is probably my favorite Christmas, or one of my favorite Christmas Eve services, or verses. It says this, and let's read it out loud because it's a cool verse. Let's read it out loud. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. When the fullness of the time came. When the fullness of the... Another version says, like, when it was the right time. But I like the word fullness. I like the word fullness. That word, uh, that, that word uh, it means to make full, fill, fill up without any gap. That's what it means. So my prayer is you're going to gain a new perspective of time. Typically, when we think about time, you might think of a a 24-hour time period. You might think of a a seven-day-a-week time period. You might think of our our, our calendar system, 365 days. And you might think in that type of mentality, that's your perspective. But there's another perspective. God doesn't look at time the way you and I do. Not at all. Scripture says, when the fullness of time came... 
God sent his only son, Jesus, into the world. Well, when I look at this, I'm like, what does this mean? The fullness of time came. What happened? You have to remember, God works in seasons, and he works in cycles and events, and he looks at the spiritual climate of events, and he works in hearts and minds and souls, and he works through all kinds of stuff. When you look at the fullness of time, I want to show you this page, because I think I showed this page a while back, but I want to show it again. This is a page I have right before the New Testament. So you have the Old Testament on, on this side. This is all the Old Testament. But the New Testament, there's this blank page. It represents 400 years. 400 years. So in the Old Testament, that's the time before Jesus came into our world. But the New Testament is the time when Jesus came into our world. So Scripture says, when the fullness of time came, God sent his only son. So the question is, what happened in these 400 years? What happened? When the fullness of time came, when the time was right, according to God's eyes, God sent his only son. Now, this blank page, there's approximately 400 years of silence. That's what it's known as, where God didn't speak any word. In fact, in 400 BC, you see God using the prophet Malachi. And the next time God speaks a word to everyone is through a man named John the Baptist. And through him. So that's approximately AD 25. So you see this this gap from 400 BC to AD 25 where God doesn't say anything. Everybody hears a word from God. Could you imagine going through life and not hearing one word from God? That would be hell for me. I need to hear a word from God. There's something about it when you hear a word from God. It just puts a pep in your step. <laughs> you know, it just, it just fuels you up and you're like, okay, everything is good. But there's these 400 silent years. Now remember, to fill, this idea of filling up is about to make full, fill, fill up without a gap. And I want to help you understand what God was doing. In those 400 years, God was preparing the world for his son, Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do, guys. I'm going to, I'm going to help you understand this, and we're going to do this together because I want, I want you to see this here. If you could imagine, this is how God sees time. And it started in Genesis chapter 3. The fall happens, and all of a sudden, because of the fall, you see the first drop starts coming. There's a plan. God's going to send his son, Jesus, into the world. But it has to be the right time. God chooses a man named Abraham, and a whole nation is developed. And God starts teaching them how to walk with him. But they rebel, and they do all kinds of stuff. And, 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 and you know, you see them worship God, and then they worship false idols and this kind of thing. And God's preparing the, the entrance of his son. And eventually, you see Israel... They turn away from God, and a nation named Assyria takes them into exile. Another nation named Babylon takes the southern kingdom away, and you see them turn away. But then something happens. Let's just start in 559 BC. There's this king named Cyrus. He's a king of Persia. And this king is the king of Persia, and that's where the Israelites are captured right there. But God moves in the heart of a pagan king to send Israel back home. He says, you guys can go back to Jerusalem and you can rebuild your temple and actually gives them the funds to do that. Think about that. Glory to God. Sometimes we think I can't do something because I don't have the money. But if you're in the will of God, God will provide. God will make a way. So he sends them back. And in 559 BC, uh, King Cyrus' heart is moved and he, he sets Israel free. And, and they, they start rebuilding the temple. And in fact, this is a time when you read in 445 BC, the walls of Jerusalem are completed by this guy named Nehemiah. Nehemiah, he rebuilds the wall. And in 430 BC, the Jews return to Israel from Babylonian <laughs> captivity. And when they come back, they've learned a little bit. They have a renewed spiritual hunger for God. You ever been through tough stuff and you're thinking like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know what's going on. And when you go through tough stuff, when you come out on the other end, typically, hopefully, you're more hungry for God. You're more hungry to do, make the, the right decisions, the better decisions. And that's what's happening here with Israel. And then something else happens. Let's just jump to 356 BC. Um, a man named Alexander the Great comes into the world. Alexander the Great rules, and, and, and he becomes ruler, and, and he's this Macedonian king. He conquers the eastern Mediterranean, Egypt, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. And it's during this time, Alexander the Great, he does something. He wants, he wants to unify the ancient world culturally. 
So everything, what, what he does, he starts, he starts, he visions this, uh, unifying this ancient world, and it becomes known as Hellenization. Basically, it's the Greekifying, Greekifying the ancient world. He wants to, everyone to be Greek, or know Greek, know the culture Greek. He, he wants everyone to know that language. And, and that's probably one of the biggest things he did, is there's this new unifying language that was introduced, and it was, it's Greek. It's Greek. That's why the Old Testament which is written in Hebrew, was translated into Greek. And it's known as the Septuagint. It's because of Alexander the Great. And that's why the New Testament was written in Greek at the time. Because of Alexander the Great. Ultimately, that's why, he, that's why the New Testament was not written in Hebrew, but written in Greek. Because again, something else happens. Uh, in, in 198 BC, there's this guy named Antiochus uh, III, and he gets control of Palestine. But it's an interesting thing. Uh, God creates this uh, spiritual um, dilemma, this tension. And God uses this guy named Antiochus III. And under him, three things were considered a capital crime. One was this. The observance of a Sabbath, capital crime. Practice of circumcision, capital crime. And the possession of Hebrew scriptures, capital crime. And what was happening during this time was God was preparing his people. They've come back from exile, and little by little, the Israel, the, the, Israel, the, the children of God were, were beginning to revolt. They were like, okay, wait a minute, you know, this is wrong. And a spiritual contempt, a zeal, a holy discontent was happening inside of them. You know what I'm talking about? It's like we can go through life and we have our own convictions, we have our own values, and, and we typically are very careful about spreading those values because that's, that's our world, right? We got to be, you know, that's just the way we think. But then something happens in our world where we say, that's wrong. You know what I'm talking about? Have you been there before? And you can't help but to speak up. This is wrong. Wherever that point is, that's what was happening inside of the hearts of, 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 of Israel. And in 164 BC, there's this incredible revolt, revolt named uh, the Maccabean Revolt. That was in 164 BC. And under that time, the temples of Jerusalem were open again, and the celebration of Jewish worship began. That's a big deal. That was 164 BC. And by 51 BC, there's this other guy named Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar comes in, and he's, he's only uh, Caesar for a little bit because he was assassinated in 44 BC. But in 31 BC, there's this guy named Octavian that overtakes Egypt, and there's no competition. And he, he gains this new title, Caesar Augustus. And from this, very, from this time on, he's the first emperor in Rome. There's Caesar Augustus. Now, this is incredible. Because you see the spiritual climate, the Israelites are starting to have this holy discontent and things are happening and there's a new universal language, right? There's a new Greek and that's what's happening. Rome was the new empire. Rome appoints a puppet king in Rome. His name is Herod the Great. He's just a puppet king. That's all he is. And it's during this time, um, something else Rome did is Rome uh, brought peace. It was the civilization. It was a time of peace. It was known as Pax Romana, peace. And during this time also, Rome brought roads into this whole area so that the Caesars could travel. Now, these roads were very, that, that was a big, in, the, the, God's creating an infrastructure. When you look at the New Testament and you look at the early church, the early church used these roads to travel and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the moment, they didn't understand what was happening. And Rome is the one who built these roads. I look at it and you know, it's just beautiful the way God works. Sometimes things happen around us and we don't understand why they're happening. But have you ever considered God's going to use someone else's effort for his purpose in your life? They have no idea what they're doing is actually going to be- benefit you, not them. Glory to God. I just, I just dropped some pearls out from right in front of you right there. I hope you picked them up. That's what God does. And, and, and you see this happening. Travel and commerce was all of a sudden made possible because of Rome. Now it's spiritually right. Israel is waiting for the Messiah. There's this new hunger for the Messiah. There's this new hunger about him. And Jews proclaim monotheism. Uh, where the Jews said, we, only want, we, we worship one God. We're going back to the basics. 
We're not going to make the same mistakes. We came from exile, and we're not going to make the same mistakes anymore. We're going we're gonna to focus on one God. So there's this new craving for the Messiah, for being right with God, doing things the right way. It's like someone who, who decides to go to church. You know, it's so similar. You can look at the life of the Israelites and you can look at our personal lives and there's time when we wander. And then there, I always, when I talk to people, I, 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 I talk to them and, and they're like coming back to church and they've come back two times in a row. You know what I mean? They haven't been in church like a year and they're back to back, which is a big deal. And they're like, you know what? I, they have this new zeal to just be right with God. Or they're not going to let anything come between them and their relationship with God anymore. Israel is hoping for a new king. And they're under Rome, and they had this new spiritual hunger, and everything is right. And when the time was right, in the fullness of time, there it is, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the right time came, there it is, when the right time came, you see that? When the right time came, and you see, it was the fullness of time. It was the perfect time. You can get a close-up shot of that water, as close as you can. In the fullness of time, when the right time came, God sent his son. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God did for Christmas. When the fullness of time came. You have a God who's intentional. He's intentional. When the right time came. Think about this. When the right time, I just read this this last week. We read it together as a staff. I read the story about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth Zechariah, it was his turn. He was a priest. He went into the, it was his lot. He happened to be serving in the temple that day. And he goes in and he meets this angel and the angel tells him, your, your, your wife's going to have a baby. And he questions God and God makes him mute. Like brings, just zap with a remote control. Just mutes Zechariah. Just like that. And he comes out. Now think about this. The chances. It just so happens it was Zechariah's turn to go into the temple just so happened to be that. And it just so happened that Elizabeth got pregnant and that was John the Baptist. It just so happened to be that time. And you just work backwards all the way to the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel predicts the day when Jesus will, the Messiah will die. I mean, down to the number of days and everything from that day when it was prophesied with Daniel in Babylon, under, I mean, in Babylon, that's where God told Daniel, this is what, and that's the prophecy. And you count down the days all the way to the exact time when Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It just blows me away how intentional God is. Think about this. Elizabeth gets pregnant at just the right time. Mary gets pregnant at just the right time. And everything goes, all just butts, all just fits together so beautifully right into Jerusalem when Jesus rides into Jerusalem and he goes to a cross for us at just the right time. God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Nothing catches him off guard. He's not surprised by anything. There's not one area in, in our life or one decision or a circumstance that's unexpected to God. God is all-knowing. And wherever you are, he knows where you're at. God saw it coming before you saw it coming. He doesn't worry. He doesn't stress. We worry and we stress. But the more you, you recognize the timing of God and you recognize the way he works, you will worry less. You will stress less. You will have no anxiety. You will trust God. All Your, your job is to walk with God. I thought about this. Now, here's the big question. How do you know God's perfect time? How do you know? How do you know? What happens when we ignore, you know, the timing of God and when we take matters into our own hands? When it becomes hard, what do you do? Some of you, you know, when it becomes hard or when it becomes inconvenient, you just give up or you walk or you say, this isn't for me or whatever it is or, or, or you, um, whatever it is. We can make decisions that will hurt us because... We're not patient. We're not willing to wait. And there's a lot of consequences that we live with when we make a mess out of our lives because we're not, we have the wrong perspective of time and we're not willing to wait. And we might buy something we shouldn't buy. We might get into debt we shouldn't be getting into. We might get in a relationship we shouldn't get into. Whatever it is, we jump too soon. And, and the truth is, it's about the fullness of time. So, so here's what I want to help you understand is how do you know, how do you know when? How do you know the perfect timing 
What does that look like? So what I thought about is I, I wanna, I'm not going to, this is not a time management message. I'm going to get into the spiritual, the heart, the DNA, the core of knowing when it's the right time. Okay. So I'm gonna, I want to give you another perspective. So here it is. There's three things I want to share with you. Number one is this. You got to make sure the time is ripe. Make sure the time is ripe. Notice we're not talking about minutes or hours or days or months or weeks or years. The time has to be ripe. Have you ever eaten a, maybe a banana that's not ripe? Trying to peel a banana that's not ripe? You ever try to just get a fruit that's not ripe? It's hard, isn't it? Have you ever tried to yank a fruit off the tree? My parents have a grape, had a grapefruit tree on their, in their front yard. I remember times when I tried to pull that grapefruit, but if it's not ripe, it's hard to pull off the branch. Right? You know what I'm talking about. But what happens when it's ripe? You just tickle it a little bit and just falls right off, right? What happens when that banana is ripe? Oh, the peel just comes off so beautifully. That orange, whatever it is, when, the, when it's ripe, there's no effort. When it's ripe, when the fullness of time has come. When it's ripe, it's easy. Much of our lives, what God is doing is he's getting you to a ripe place. That's what he's doing. The reason why you haven't gotten that job, the reason why you haven't gotten whatever it is, he's working on you. He wants you to get to a ripe place. The problem is when we're unfaithful and disobedient and stubborn and prideful, it takes some of us a little bit longer (laughs) because God's waiting for you to get to a ripe place. You know, when you walk with God and you discover who God is, you have a new desire. And I'm just going to tell you, I, I, I love reading God's word. And you know why I love reading God's word? is because he's gotten me to this ripe place where I know how bad I need him. You know what I'm talking about? I go, church is not like, like work for me at all. I go to church and I love to worship God. But you don't know. The reason why is because he's gotten me to a right place. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm, some of you know what I'm saying. You don't look at spiritual disciplines as work. It's because you're, you're ripe. Same thing like when you're in love with someone. Is spending time with that person work? No way. You just love being with them. It's not work. You just love being with them. And, and you have to understand, make sure the time is ripe. Ecclesiastes said it like this, for everything, there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. There's a season for everything. So the challenge is you need to be faithful to God in the season you're in. Unmarried, married. Unemployed, employed. Whatever season you're in, you have little, you have much. Life, death, accident, health, whatever it is, you need to be faithful in the season that you're in because it's just passing through. And God wants you to be faithful in that season. He's watching you. He's working. He's he's building you up. He's making you ripe so that he can use you for his kingdom. And he wants you to, so you have to learn, be faithful in the season that you're in. You have no car, you have a car. Whatever it is, you have a, you're living in out of your car, you're living in an apartment, you're living in a house, big house, whatever it is. Be faithful in the season that you're in. And verse two says, a time, there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest. Another way to look at it is there's a time when it's ripe. What happens when you put seed in the ground? You know what you look at on the top? Nothing. It's dirt. Right? When you put seed in the ground, you don't see anything on the top. When you look at that seed, you you don't see any of that stuff. But a good farmer knows, you know, I need to put seed in the ground because it is going to be harvest season down the road. So I need to put seed in the ground by faith. And here's what's happening. There's more happening underground than what can be seen above ground. 
There's all kinds of things happening underground. The seed is dying and, and there's roots that are starting to work. And there's a whole infrastructure of a network happening under the ground that nobody sees. And that's what happens in a lot of us. God's working in your heart and you let God work underground in your life. And he's creating and he's moving and he's shaking and he's, he's and all of a sudden it's going to come out. It's going to shoot out and everybody's going to say, where did that come from? And they have no idea. Oh, it's been working underground for a long time. You just haven't been seeing it. I have a new burden to walk with God. I have a new passion to walk with God. I have a, it's been in my heart. I've been spending time with God and you have no idea. Jesus said this, speaking about ripeness, he said, he, and this is in John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is the, 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 the chapter where Jesus meets the woman at the well. Incredible chapter. Meets the woman at the well and, and, he, and he asks for a drink. And, you know, there's a whole conversation between him and this woman who had many husbands. And the man she was with was not her husband. But Jesus reaches out to this woman. And it's a beautiful, beautiful story. But in, he, he tells his disciples, um, my nourishment, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvesting. But I say, wake up. Say, wake up with me. Say, wake up. And look around. Say, look around with me. The fields are ready. What? They're ripe for harvest. Now, Jesus, he's, it's a new perspective what he's doing right here. He's giving the disciples a new lens, a new perspective. He wants them to understand how God works. And he's saying, look, I know you guys are just used to looking at the fields. And when the corn comes up, when the, when, when the grain comes, you're like, that's time. But wake up and look around. See, this is how God works. He's working in souls. He's working in hearts. He's working in minds. He's allowing you to go through experiences in your life so that you can get to the point where you recognize you need God. To get you to that point where you recognize, I hunger for God. I want to know Jesus. No, I'm not playing anymore. I need to know Jesus. I'm not playing anymore. I want to know God. I'm not playing anymore. I want, to, I want his will. I'm not faking it anymore. I really want it. And Jesus tells his disciples, lift up your heads and look around. Do you see God working? That's what Jesus is saying. Do you recognize what my father is doing? Let me put it this way. Do you recognize there's people around you, maybe people you work with, people you live with, people you do life with, people you go to school with, and you know what God's been doing? He's been ripening their hearts. Do you see it? Wake up. Look up. Wake up. Look up. They're right around you. God is working on their souls, getting them to a place where they're spiritually ripe. And it's not by accident that you're in their life. God can use you. Have you ever talked to someone who's spiritually ripe? You say something like, hey, I want to invite you to church. And you know what they say? Oh, I've been looking for a church. I've been thinking about church already. Have you had those conversations? Oh, I've already been thinking about it. Yeah, it's funny you bring it up. That's what they say. It's funny you bring it up. I've already been thinking. That's God. It's his prevenient grace. He's already working in their hearts. You didn't know it until you opened up your mouth and started talking to them. That's when you discovered. But God's already working inside of them. And you just said, well, thank the Lord you opened up your mouth and was courageous enough to say something. Because God, some of you, let me just say, God is waiting for you to open up your big mouth. He is waiting. Because there are some spiritually right people around you. That neighbor. And you don't know what experiences they're going through, but God has been working on them. And he's waiting for that ripe time. And you're there because he wants you to tell them about Jesus. He wants you to tell them about God's love. The fields are ripe for harvest. They're ripe. This morning, um, when I was getting ready for church, 
I was watching some um, college football, uh, Jackson State University, you know, Deion Sanders, and he's coming to see you and all that. Anyway, they, they lost. Anyway, not that, anyway, I'm probably the only one watching that game. Anyway, so I was watching the game, and, and it was like the second quarter or something like that. I'm watching it, and I, I was uh, getting ready for, for church. Uh, well, at that time, I just had my jeans on. Anyway, so I looked down, and I noticed my belt was broke. I don't know what happened. It was just like broke like the buckle was broke. And I was like, this is so weird, so bizarre. I don't remember it busting or anything like that. It's like, I don't, I didn't eat that much. I don't know what happened, but it just was broke. So I took a picture of it like that. And I, I said, I said, I said, Grace, check out my belt broke. That's so weird. Like now I got to, you know, I have this system, this routine I have on Saturdays when I go to church and, you know, things that I do and getting ready for the message and all. And I'm thinking now I got to go buy a belt because I don't want to be preaching and my pants fall off while I'm preaching. I got to go buy a belt. So I, uh, I, I, I thought, where do I go buy a belt? And I thought, well, I'll go to the outlet mall. They have like a Levi's store or something like that. And then Levi's, you know, belts there. And while I'm walking to the Levi's store, so I leave early and I'm going to the Levi's store. And, and while I'm walking there, I, I see the Columbia store. And uh, I, 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 I like the Columbia store and we get a little discount there f- from family, friends discount kind of thing. So I saw it and I thought, well, maybe I'll go in there and I'll look and I'll look real quick. And I looked and I said, well, this one's kind of cool. And I was like, well, I'm going to go to the Levi's store. Go to the Levi's store. I come back to the Columbia store and I'm going to, okay, I'm going to get this belt. So I'll go ahead and I buy this belt. I don't know if you can see it. But anyway, I bought this belt at the Columbia store. <laughs> so I bought it and, and, and I, 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 while I'm there, I run into a woman that hasn't been in church in a long time. I'll just tell you, she's a wonderful, wonderful Christian woman. Her, her, her family's a wonderful Christian family. Her husband's a wonderful Christian guy. And he got hurt by church years ago. And because of that hurt, this family has stopped going to church completely now for years because they were hurt at church. Boy, the devil uses those situations to separate people from churches all the time. It's just t-ball for the devil. It's just easy for the devil. So I'm starting to talk to her and I say, hey, are you going anywhere from Christmas Eve? Knowing full well, this is one of those Christians that are, they walk with God, but they don't, they're not committed to any church. They love their Bible, but they're not committed to any, any kind of community. They're not serving, any of that stuff. They're, it's just, they're not part of his church, but they're a Christian. And I say, are you going to Christmas Eve service center? And then she says, no, we, we really, I, I work so much. I, I don't think we can. And I happen to have a Christmas Eve invite card in my wallet. And I pulled it out and I said, hey, um, we have six services. And I gave it to her and she looked at it and she says, you know what? I think I can make the six o'clock on Saturday. I think I can make that one. And I walked away from that and I thought, do you think God broke my belt? (laughs) Do you think God did something like that? You think I'm silly. I know you do. You don't know how long I've been walking with God. Some of you saints know what I'm talking about. Do you think she's just spiritually ripe? And God wanted me to walk into that Columbia store to invite her because he loves her and he cares for her and he wants healing to happen in his heart and her heart. Glory to God. That's that's our God. That's our God. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. And I walked away, I called Grace and I said, baby, I think I just, I think I, I think it was God's will for my belt to break. And I think I've just been part of a God thing, right? I mean, this is God. And all of a sudden I look down on my belt and I think, oh, God cares so much about souls. I like the way uh, Peter says it in 2 Peter. He says, do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Isn't that a good Sometimes we look at our situations and we say, oh, it's taking too long. I should be by now. Oh, you got to hear this. Sometimes we think, oh, I should have been by now. I should have been at this place by now. I should have graduated by now. I should be in this place salary level by now. I should be in this economic place, this lifestyle by now. I should have, do you know what I'm talking about? We can do that. God's more concerned with you being ripe for his will because he's the father who owns the cattle in a thousand hills. He 
He's not concerned about time like we're concerned about time. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. So this is just this is just good stuff here, guys. The second thing is this: you got to accept God's plan over your plan. Accept God's plan over your plan. Here's what we can do sometimes. Sometimes we can reject God's guidance because the answer looks different from what we envisioned. We can pray, God, I need you to do this for me or I need to get out of this. And God can provide a way and we can look at that and say, well, I didn't pray for that. And we can reject what God is doing because it doesn't line up to what we think should be happening. Now, it's about ripeness and it's about his plan, not your plan, because his plan is always better. Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You hear that? That, you know what that means? That means you're not that smart. That means God sees everything. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. His ways are greater than our ways. And what I've discovered is the path God has for us many times, most of the time, it's completely different from what we envisioned. And here's the other thing I've, I've, I've learned. We think in our minds, oh, this is the position I should be. And we could miss out on what God is doing today in our lives. We cannot, we can overlook it and not recognize, oh, you don't understand. You're waiting for this dream to happen. You're living in the dream right now. You don't get it. You're doing all this planning for the future. You don't recognize God is with you today. And you should walk with him today. And so many times we start worshiping that future goal. And we don't recognize God is at work today. You're living in the glory days. You're living in the good old days. Glory to God. You're in the middle of the good old days. There's no past good old days. Today's even better. And you're in the middle of it right now. Rejoice over it. The other thing I've recognized is God's plan and will always includes the redemption of others. Always includes the redemption of others. When God works in our lives and he works, he wants us to be spiritually ripe. It's never just for you. It's not just for your retirement. It's not just so that you'll have more money. It always includes the redemption of others. Others people look at your life and you say, wow, where can I get some of that? His name is Jesus. That's where you can get some of that. It always includes the redemption of others. And last thing I want to say is this. This is all secret sauce stuff, guys. Here it is. Focus more on your soul than your goal. That's so good. Focus more on your soul than your goal. Some of you are worshiping your goal. If you put as much effort into your soul as you are to your goal, Wow, the devil would be worried about you. The devil would be worried about you. As a pastor, I have seen people focus more on their goal and neglect their soul. And they're focused on that business. They're focused on making money. They're focused on, and you know what? They typically, we're so good at reasoning within ourselves. We say, well, we're going to focus on this so then we can do this. Truth is, you're more in love with your goal than you are. You hear what I'm saying? And what I've discovered is when you allow God to work on the inside, it's so upside down. I get it. It's so upside down. You know, you know I know some of you are, give me a task. Give me a Google task. Give me a spreadsheet. That's how I operate. And I get that. But you want to know the will of God? Focus more on your soul. And then you'll recognize the will of God better. Romans says it like this. Chapter 12, verse 1. 
You know what, guys? I'm going to read Psalm chapter 37. Let's go to Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Did you see that? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. In other words, trust God right now. Be faithful to whatever he wants you to do and learn faithfulness. That's all internal stuff. That's, a, that's underground stuff, all that right there, isn't it? That's all underground because you can't see trust necessarily, but you can make a decision to trust God in your life, in your home, in your finances. You could, that's all underground stuff. And when that happens, and then delight yourself in the Lord and he will then give you the desires of your heart. Comes at the end. Comes at the end. Comes at the end. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. <clears throat> you got to work on your soul. You got to work on your soul. You know what? Don't, don't say, you, if you're not reading God's word, don't say you don't know what God's will is. <laughs> you don't know what God's will is because you're not spending time in God's word. If you spend time in God's word, then you'll learn who God is and you're working on your soul. Then you'll understand the will of God. But if you don't put God's word in your life and you're just trying to, you're just doing it rogue, you're trying to figure out God's will and his word is not in your life, you're relying on your own understanding. You're relying on your own understanding, your own perspective, and it's all limited because his ways are higher than your ways and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You got to get on the same page with God. You spend time in God's word, then you'll know the will of God for your life. That's the way it works. Work on your soul, not the goal. The goal will come. Romans, Paul says it like this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Say transformed with me. The true transformation happens when you surrender yourself to Jesus. True transformation happens when you surrender yourself to God. True transformation happens when you say, God, I need you to change me. Change my heart, change my mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind then. Oh, say then with me, guys. Say then, then. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Offer yourself to God as a sacrifice. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then. Say then with me again. Say then then you'll know God's will for your life. You hear that? There's the formula right there. This is all the secret sauce stuff right here, guys. It's not about, I'm going to go down the hall and I'm going to check every door and whichever door opens, it must be God's will. It's not about, oh, that door must be, a door is open, so it must be of God. No, 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 no. You got to make sure it's about ripeness. That's when it's the right time. In the fullness of time, it's about that. And it's about a willingness to follow his plan, to not lean on your own understanding. And what happens when you work on your soul first and your goal second, let me just tell you what happens. God starts working inside of you and he's showing you things through his word. He starts speaking to you. It's like, it's like this is, this is the, the cheat notes right here. Like God starts speaking to you about something. And then when that opportunity comes in front of you, you're like, well, God's already been speaking to me about this. This is a no-brainer. This is just affirmation because he's already been working in my heart. I know what I need to do because he's already told me in the secret when I've been reading his word in my car, and I've been reading his word in my bedroom, and I've been reading my, his word in the kitchen, and I've been reading the word in his office. He's already been speaking to me. I've already been spending time with him. So when, it's, when you see it, you can recognize it. See, you're looking at things differently. You're making better decisions now because you're focusing on your soul, not your goal. God will take care of everything. He's so good. So he, he, he ministers to you, and he tells you this is going to happen. 
This is before my kids were even born. God spoke to me and said, Reuben, your wife's about to be pregnant. I knew it. So when I heard that she was pregnant, I was like, well, yeah, I know. I, yeah, it didn't surprise me at all. Didn't surprise me. Jobs, opportunities, whatever it is. Well, this doesn't surprise me at all. Why does it surprise you? Oh, you haven't been spending time in the Word like me. Shouldn't surprise you. What? This, is, this makes sense. Let God transform you. Let God transform your heart. Then you'll know God's perfect will. You got it? I'm going to say it again. I want to make sure you get it. I want to say it again. Make sure the time is ripe. Accept God's plan over your plan and focus more on your soul than your goal. <laughs> Focus more on your soul than your goal. I want to pray for you. And if, if you're ready to receive Jesus, you, you can make that decision. Some of you, um, maybe, maybe, um, maybe you're not ripe yet. And you, you're at church. And maybe you're more like, like right here. And let me just tell you, when you're ripe, um, you're quick to turn to God. You're quick to obey. You're quick to humble yourself. You're just quick to do all those things. But if you're down here, it's just, it's just you're not so quick to do those things. And there's things happening in your life, and God is, is trying to get you to be more ripe. He, he wants you to turn, he wants you to just be tender. He wants you to be tender. It's an incredible freeing place to surrender yourself completely to the will of God. It's an incredible freeing place. I want to encourage you to humble yourself before the Lord. Cry out to God and see what he'll do in your life. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. Uh, God, thank you for your Holy Spirit. I've sensed your Holy Spirit even as I've been up here speaking. Thank you, Lord. And we turn to you. So just have your way, God. Uh, have your way. And if you're ready to receive Jesus, um, maybe you're online or maybe you're in person and you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you just say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart right now. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for my sins. Right now, I want to walk with you and I choose to become a Christian. Others of you, maybe you've been determining the will of God in the wrong way. Maybe you've been leaning on your own understanding. Maybe you've been focusing more on your goal than your soul. Maybe you've been worshiping the wrong thing or the wrong person. Whatever it is, would you just say, God, forgive me. I want to get right. I want to be, I want to, I'm going to trust God that you brought me to church for this message. I'm going to trust you, God, that you led me to watch this, this sermon online. And, and right now, I turn to you with all of my heart. No more plan. And I want your will for my life. Even if it looks different from what I envisioned, I want your will, God. So have your way. Thank you, God, for your grace and for your love and your mercy. Thank you, God, that you're the God of new beginnings. That you're the God who never gives up. And your grace is with us all the way in Genesis chapter 3. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.